Goddamn, that's a catchy intro. That's compliments of Andre Petipa, my guest from episode one. If you haven't heard that, I encourage you to do so, and thank you for tuning in to episode two. I hope we find you in good health and in good cheer. I am speaking to you from Chateau Robert. I'm in my office with Opal the Cat, who's kind of a shitty conversationalist. She might chime in with nonsense or knock the microphone over. Who's to say at this point? We are midpoint April, and we are still neck deep in the coronavirus pandemic. I know you're listening to this to try to avoid thinking about that for a little bit, but it's such a juicy subject, so forgive me if I got to speak moistly for a little bit. We are still being advised by health authorities to stay in whenever possible, and if you do have to go out, please practice social distancing. That's keeping everybody a couple arm lengths away. My preferred method is making fists and swinging my arms like a maniac like I used to do in elementary school. You know, you holler, I'm just going to swing my arms and walk forward, and if you're in the way and get hit, that's not my fault. It gets me through the grocery store way quicker and with way less hassle. I know this uh, virus is kind of boring, and I hear a lot of people saying they wanted zombies. If your solution to a respiratory illness was hoarding toilet paper, don't fucking talk to me about zombies. You're not ready for that yet. COVID-19 has more in common with a vampire. Can't come in your house unless you invite it. Not quite as ambitious as a vampire. You can't just say, hey, come on in. You can't even offer to pay its cab fare and wait for it. You actively have to go out and bring it home yourself. It's more like a Pokemon Go with a death wish. Although people who played Pokemon Go, a lot of them did have a death wish. They were staring at their phones and walking off cliffs and out in front of vehicles. It's fucking hilarious. It was really funny. It was natural selection at its best. However, people walking out in front of vehicles and getting creamed is way funnier than someone being stuck in a hospital, hooked up to a respirator, scared and alone. So I do encourage you all, if you do got to go out, please stay safe. And I know you're thinking, well, I survive it. I'm young. I'm healthy. I get that too sometimes. I mean, I eat chicken strips after cooking them in the oven without turning them halfway through like it says on the box, so I know I'm pretty goddamn invincible, but still, you gotta be careful about this thing. I'm really hoping that everybody gets through this as best they can, happy and healthy. I really want you to survive and get to the other side of this problem, because I'm gonna need you to pay me to do stand-up comedy. That's kind of where I'm at with this whole thing. I mean, otherwise, I'm just sitting here watching Netflix, running out of shows to watch. I just watched Nailed It, which I've never watched a cooking show in my life, so there's that. I'm watching uh, shows about hauntings and stuff, and kind of sitting here wondering, how come a house never starts manifesting any paranormal activity until someone is having trouble paying the mortgage? Is no one else wondered that? I mean, look back as far as the Amityville haunting, the Lutz family. His company wasn't doing good, you were running out of money, and then all of a sudden everything starts going bump in the night. I mean, there's got to be something to that. If I have any listeners who work at a bank, or you have a friend or a cousin that works in a bank, maybe you can message me and let me know. Does a house being haunted give you grounds to break your mortgage? That's a question that I'm wondering Not because I'm worried about my mortgage. I'm still working full-time because I am an expendable, uh, essential worker, I mean. Essential worker. So it's just something that I've been curious about. If anyone's got an answer, you can reach me through my Instagram or my Facebook page. I should probably link those to one of these at some point. That being said, thinking about the Amityville Horror, I happen to be a huge horror movie fan. I love horror movies, big budget ones, crappy B-grade ones. I'm just a sucker for them all. It brings me to my next guest who is a bit of a movie buff himself and also happens to be a fan of horror, so I think we should uh, get him on here. Opal, what do you think? No answer, just the look that says, I'm going to kill you in your sleep. Well, that's worrisome. Hmm. All right, so this episode's guest, Skylar Greencorn. Skylar, I know you're a busy guy with uh, your own project, so I want to thank you for hopping on this with me and having a chat. So for everyone who's going to be listening, tell us what you do. Uh, Yeah. Uh, Oh, my goodness. Uh, Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me on. Kind of weird being on someone else's podcast. It's really strange. I'm used to talking about (laughs) kind of, I have a pretty linear bit of storytelling 
when it comes to my own podcasting, which is all just movie related. Oh boy, uh, the beginnings. I'll start a little bit about myself. So I am a animation and digital art instructor from Halifax, Nova Scotia. I grew up in a really small kind of fishing town, uh, Canso, Nova Scotia. It, uh, it's actually quite beautiful to visit. And it was really uh, great and humbling growing up in a place like that. Lots of wonderful, lovely people. Everyone was really friendly. Wouldn't be where I am without it. But uh, needless to say, I was a bit of an odd duck in a town like this because uh, I was not uh, very sportsmanlike. I was a very closeted nerd. I had to kind of keep to myself a lot about all of my uh, things that I really enjoyed and and all that good stuff. Uh, I grew up very much inspired by movies and monsters and all of this this ridiculous silliness, silliness that uh, has spiraled into this uh, glorious career driven mentality that I have now. So. I started very much with Jurassic Park, I guess. That's kind of where it started. When I was a kid, I was blown away by the visual effects in that movie, the dinosaurs. I thought they were real. I was convinced. I was obsessed with dinosaurs. And I'm talking like, I was like seven or eight years old. I was very young. Every kid uh, at that age was kind of obsessed with dinosaurs. I just think that uh, you neglected to grow out of it. but Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's about right. I, uh, so I p- would pour them onto just pages. My mom uh, could not keep a pencil out of my hand. I was always drawing, I guess, maintaining some sort of level of artistic and creative outlet. Like I was always just kind of like pouring it out of me. I, I couldn't stop. Uh, one shitty drawing after another they were all just hot garbage <laughs> and then uh, eventually I got relatively good for my age and because I just kept at it I was obsessed but it was later when I was a teenager where I reflected back on Jurassic Park and I discovered that the way that they handled the visual effects in that movie uh, were really interesting namely the T-Rex the wide shots of the T-Rex in that movie were all of course CGI and probably the earliest form of it Uh, which would later lead to my career choice, which I work in visual effects. The wide shots of the T-Rex were, of course, all done in darkness and rain. And I would later discover that whenever you want to cover up really bad effects, really shitty looking garbage, just make it nighttime and make it raining. Um, I'm looking at you, Blade Runner. What does raining Uh, do? So the rain just distorts and basically blurs your vision as to what you're seeing. Plus, because rain is dousing whatever the subject is in your screen, it's making it one consistent reflection level. Everything is wet. So because everything is wet, as long as you make it kind of shiny looking or specular, you can convincingly blend that into the scene. So it was really, really smart on their front to make that scene set it in a nighttime and in the rain, of course. And all of the close-up shots were all an animatronic head. So that's why they look so good. And coming into this knowledge blew my friggin' mind. It was like my head was just disembodied at that point where I was just like, holy shit, I want to be a magician or something. Like these guys are all like movies are magic tricks. Then came a uh, onslaught of decades of love of movies. I have an obsession with just kind of uncovering how these effects were done, which would inevitably lead to me kind of eventually dipping a toe and then an entire foot and then my whole leg into uh, the mud of visual effects. It's mind blowing to me. I didn't know that about the rain because I remember watching the, one of the Matrix movies where Keanu Reeves and Hugo Weaving are having the fight in the rain. And obviously those were very effects heavy. And I always thought like the rain was just something that would be like more impressive to add in there, like all the water splashing and whatnot. But really, it's just to cover up all their uh, pretty much all the shock yeah. them sons of bitches. Yeah. So fun fact. Blade Runner, which I already offhand mentioned, and again, not to discredit Blade Runner because I absolutely adore it. Um, oh, yeah. I'm actually one of the few people, and I'm sorry if this is fighting words for a lot of you uh, sci-fi geeks out there like myself, but uh, I actually think 2049 is a better movie. So we'll, we'll, maybe we'll touch on that later. But uh, Blade Runner infamously, uh, Ridley Scott, when he uh, initially pitched and was working on Blade Runner, it was actually supposed to be set largely in the daytime, but he could not get the effects in 1982 to work nearly as well. Like they were, there was, it was very washed out and you could really see the seams of uh, what he was trying to pull off. So he's just like, just make it dark and make it raining. Oh. You'll never know. And of course now that that look of Blade Runner, can you picture it? in any other setting right like it's always raining everyone's got it's the neon sort of like synth poppy looking desolate gross dirty science fiction universe so like it works right like yeah i um, haven't seen the new one yet actually that's oh god i love it it's on my quarantine to-do list i highly recommend it i mean yeah it's slow and meandering but so is the original so if you found the first one boring i mean 
you have to prepare yourself for the second one, but I found it far more engaging and it's just gorgeous to look at. And I found that there was more of a driving plot there that really got me interested. But anyway, if you really want to get my full opinion on that, I have a a podcast where I rave on like this about movies. A fantastic podcast where you rave on about movies. Oh, thank you. That's uh, that's high praise. I uh, I already uh, I already dig what you're doing with this one. Uh, your first episode was uh, was wicked. Pretty easy when like I have like Andre obviously is a phenomenal personality and very interesting guy and like yourself. Like I said, I listen to your podcast regularly. So when I got the chance to, hey, you want to maybe hop on mine? And of course, yeah, 100%, I mean, yeah. we're all quarantined now. So I mean, might as well sit at my desk and, 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 and talk and make it useful, I guess. We're all a little stir crazy and trying to keep ourselves productive. Uh, I mean, the best thing we can do at this point is establish some sort of routine, right? Yeah, definitely. Like I remember um, a while back, you used to do a uh, movie reviews, uh, IMHO. Oh, and that's shit. how I first. Yeah, that's, that's how I first got into your movie reviews. And uh, oh fuck! No, they were good. They were really good reviews. Uh, I I cringe going back and reading some of them. I, I still have that page up. It uh, refuses to die. And, <laughs> and occasionally, I will get uh, the odd person here and there. Uh, be like, how come you you haven't started doing this thing again? Blah 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 blah. And I mean, it's just because I diverted. So I'm a all podcaster now, motherfucker. That's what I should say. You know that's, what? I'm gonna trademark. Yeah, that's what I'm using from now on. We'll get some shirts made up for you. Yeah, podcasting motherfucker. Yeah, mm-hmm. and then just put Samuel Jackson on it. Or, I wonder if he'd uh, let us. I mean, he's in just about everything. Why wouldn't he want to be on a, one of our shirts too, right? That's that's just it. Yeah. Um, dude's like in his 80s or something, right? Yeah. What the fuck do you think he's doing now that he's quarantined and can't be on a movie set? Uh, recording Go the Fuck to Sleep for the Masses. <laughs> Just sitting home trying to find things to do and staring motherfuckerly at his wife when she tries to interrupt him. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Good Lord. Yeah, no, you bring up IMHO and uh, I mean, as much as I go back and there's a little bit of growing pains there, that was actually kind of the beginnings of something that I would fall in love with later where I was really inspired by like internet websites like uh, Red Letter Media and uh, a lot of movie critics like YouTube critics and things like that where I was really kind of getting into film criticism. So I would start di- divulging a little bit into my own and it really honed in on my writing skills too, which is why I cringe mainly when I go back and look at them because I was obviously learning. Um, if I were to write these things now, it would be very different. But um, it really made me appreciate the practical use of film criticism and how there are benefits to it, despite the fact that it's kind of like you're, uh, you're criticizing something that uh, a lot of people put a lot of hard work into. So like there is an argument to be made about Rotten Tomatoes and things like that and how that score can dictate now the success of a movie. You know, I think that there's a power to it that maybe you need to kind of lean against sometimes it should be always used as like a less of a thing that you're i guess leaning into as a deciding factor for whether you should see a movie because i think people should always make their minds up for their own don't just listen to a critic and make that your deciding factor if you're interested in something see it it's more of just kind of a professional opinion on whether you should spend your money or not that's the thing i always liked about your reviews and why i followed them number one they weren't as bad as you're beating them down right now don't be so hard on yourself and number two there's always this like aura when people talk about film critics that they're just kind of pretentious dicks and if something's not artsy fartsy they're going to tear it apart if it is artsy fartsy they'll love it even if it's as boring as dog shit right yeah that's but I always found like with yours, even if there was something that you could point out like, oh, this is fucking atrocious. However, this movie is still fun. Like you could always acknowledge the entertainment factor as opposed to just, you know, like, oh, it touches the right notes. And oh, this the art direction here was wonderful and the lighting. And it's like, well, you know what? If sometimes movies can have everything so technically perfect that you can't help but notice them because the storyline is so goddamn slow and boring. You're just looking for anything to entertain you. Pretty much, yeah. And I mean, I do have a a growing appreciation for like art house cinema and indie stuff and all that. But I also, I never forget my roots, which I think a lot of critics do. Uh, It's a problem where like, they sometimes can get so drowned in their own sensibilities that they forget where they came from. And that's something that I just refuse to do. And I mean, it also plays into just my own personality where I'm just kind of like a big kid that just refuses to grow up, I guess. When it comes to movies, like my love and passion for horror cinema, especially, and that is including like schlocky B grade garbage, right? That stuff 
is what inspired me. It uh, it really really hit home at an early age, and it just stuck. And like things like The Evil Dead, and uh, just having an appreciation again for the magic tricks that come along with movies. Like I started to really really love and appreciate really really DIY, very low budget cinema. So that permeates even into the big budget stuff. Where if something's fun, something's fun, and I'm always going to address that. Right? Oh yeah. Like it's there's always like someone that's going to enjoy something that you don't love, and that's something that I think another power of criticism that a lot of people can really learn from is accepting other people's opinion because like oh, yeah. even though you for for if there's something that you loathe and with just utter contempt and like trust me there are movies that i absolutely hate someone out there it, it struck a chord with them and that's mm-hmm. kind of a beautiful thing that it can permeate the masses in a really like unequal way it's oh nice. yeah like i feel that when i'm doing when i do my stand-up because every now and then i'll tell a joke and I can see the room completely divide. And it's like this section of the room here is fucking bent over laughing at it. And yep. then these guys over here are just giving me daggers for looks. So yeah. it's just, yeah, it's everything is so subjective like that. And uh, well, it really is. And you, do, you can be multifaceted as a person too, right? Like you, uh, I can appreciate and love the slow awkwardness of like drive. Ryan Gosling staring into nothingness for two hours and really, really love that experience. But I can also appreciate an absorbent amount of gushing blood flying out of a neck stump. And evil dead. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so it's it's about what what uh, what does it for you, I guess. And everyone has their own. You're a well cultured man, sir. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you ever just walked out of a movie theater? Like, what would it take for you to walk out of a movie theater? Throw oh. something at us. Oh fuck yes! Oh my god. Okay, I'm trying to think of the most recent one. An ex of mine drug me to watch. It's the sequel to Nomeo and Juliet, Sherlock Gnomes or something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm not a fan of garden gnomes from the start. The <laughs> like, just from the get-go, the launch pad, getting me in the theater alone is a is a challenge. And now uh, she's his ex, by the way. She's his ex now. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, note that she's my ex. Walked this into was, the theater and her life. That's right. <laughs> um, but uh, that movie's a piece of shit. Uh, it was really, really bad. Not even the animation isn't even great. The storytelling is just hot garbage. The jokes are bad. Uh, and Elton John couldn't even save it, and that's that's something. It's really bad. Um, mm. Yeah, but uh, other than that, nothing has offended me on a level that I haven't said to myself, "Hmm, maybe I'll throw that fourteen dollars down the drain and just leave." <laughs> you know, there isn't too many, and I've sat through a lot of the, the Transformers movies too. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah I don't, termination. Don't, yeah, I don't know why. There's just an endurance test of awful. 20 minutes of landscape scenery and uh, flying over something for transition. Yeah, that's a hard one. Yeah, if you take a cardboard box and poke some holes in it and to put your camera th- in there and then throw some tinfoil balls in there and then close the lid and shake it up and record that, that's pretty much how the fight scenes go in that movie. It's just scraping metal and nothingness. I've uh, had more fun watching screensavers that bounce around the screen Have you ever gotten stuck watching it, waiting it to go perfectly into the corner and right back out the same direction? Yes. Oh my God. I I get, you get lost in it. I've had more fun doing that than watching some of the Transformers movies. I'm sorry, Michael Bay fans. Fuck people keep pouring money into that man's pocket. So there's gotta be a lot of them. I'm looking at you, China. (laughs) (laughs) Damn you, China and your affinity for Michael Bay. They sure do love uh, big robots, which, you know, undeniably I I can relate to because I'm a fan of Pacific Rim. Um, yeah it's just a completely different animal altogether uh the the transformers movies you can't knock the visual effects it's incredible what they did especially the compositing in that movie it's just mind-boggling like i look at those movies and i'm just blown away at the work but it's the decision making characters the human characters especially the storytelling and just the noisy just completely bonkers action sequences i'm goddamn exhausted after watching a movie like that or even the pirates of the caribbean movies i found i'm watching them and then i'm done and i shut it off and i get up and i'm like holy shit i need a nap yep that first pirates movie is legit i I can go back and watch that and you can tell that there's like a love and an admiration to everything that they're doing even depp is not phoning in at all you can tell that he like really loved playing that character and then with each sequel it just got more meandering and more ridiculous like i have a little bit of a sweet spot for uh dead man's chest i thought uh davy jones was a uh, really really cool character design yeah he was that might be my uh, Lovecraftian interest kind of uh, taking over, I suppose. But I, I, I like the scene where he plays the piano with his weird tentacle beard. That was kind of neat. Yeah, that there I kind of marked out for on that one. 
Yeah, yeah, but the, yeah, those movies just got kept getting weirder and weirder and weirder. The third one was just the most bizarre thing in the world. There was, I don't recall the plot. Some big voodoo lady turns into a giant and then turns into crabs. I remember Johnny Depp licking a rock. Yeah, I have that same thing where I'll watch a movie like that. And when it's done, I literally have one of those what the fuck just happened moments. Like I have movies that I've watched like twice through and I still can't tell you what the goddamn plot is. It's just. Yeah, exactly. It, uh, it just kind of goes in one ear and out the other. It's like somebody trying to tell you a story while shooting you with a paintball gun. And you're just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to think of uh, some others that really inspired me. Alien is, uh, I think, if I have to pick a favorite movie, I wrestle between that one and Pan's Labyrinth constantly mm. those two are always just kind of like arm wrestling to see who's more victorious and it really depends on the week when Yo, you ask yeah. me do you have any of your personal favorites of your own personal favorite movies i'm a big batman fan so i really like the dark knight that's i thought that was just magnificent um you ever seen the movie i'm sure you have dark city oh yeah that movie's great yeah i fucking love dark city i watch that on the regular no one talks about that movie and i don't know why it's kind of like what they tried to do with equilibrium for the matrix almost it was kind of like that but a bit more gothic it had everything it had like sci-fi had horror elements the story was good like the story was well thought out i uh first watched it a friend of mine recommended it to me and it was on dvd they said here i'm gonna loan you this movie you're gonna love it Here's the catch though. You have to start it from scene two where you avoid the narration that kind of tells you what's going on at the first. Yep. And so I pick up right at the part where the main character first kind of wakes up into this situation and I'm just kind of piecing it together as he does. And if anyone hasn't seen it and they want to watch it, start it off at the second scene. That's my recommendation for that. Oh shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. For fear of spoilers, I won't uh, elaborate. But yeah, that movie's great. There's a yeah, there's a lot of like unsung heroes like that. A lot of movies that are kind of personal, I guess, to me that uh, others maybe haven't seen or they don't get to appreciate it nearly as much. I'm trying to think of some great drinking game movies. The Evil Dead trilogy. You can just watch all three of those in a row and play the drinking game online. But I don't want to encourage that for alcohol poisoning fears. But I mean, we're all quarantined, so I mean, might as well. Mind you, all the uh, medical professionals are all busy taking care of people affected with coronavirus. So if you yeah. do get alcohol poisoning, you might want to have some charcoal on hand yourself because you might have to wait a little bit to get your stomach pumped. That's true. Yeah. Um, don't play the Pacific Rim drinking game where every time they say Jaeger, you take a shot of Jaeger. <laughs> That's a mistake. Yeah. It's dangerous, sir. Yeah. So uh, something I want to get to because I think it's fantastic and I want everyone to know about it. Tell everyone about Silver Screen Anomalies. Oh boy. So Silver Screen Anomalies is my mine and my co-host Hallie's podcast where we basically pin two movies that are usually like similar in some way together and we discuss them and compare them. Sometimes we uh, taper off into a uh, a separate show that is part of Silver Screen Anomalies called Remake Rumble, where we take the original and a remake and make them go head to head and uh, discuss at length using a uh, very elaborate point system why we think one is better than the other. Um, so it's it's very much a movie discussion podcast. It's all in good fun. We uh, we we get really silly and often or are hopped up on tons of caffeine when we record it. So it's uh, pretty cool. Hallie and I also, we've been friends now for a couple of years and our friendship was basically based around movies. So I, uh, I teach at a college and I was having an open house and uh, she showed up kind of like perusing through and uh, looking at all the different programs. And she was actually, uh, she's a writer. So she was more interested in uh, that field, but uh, stumbled into animation. And that's when we met and kind of hit it off. Ever since we have been uh, very good friends and have, this uh, this bond over movies and it just uh, you can kind of feel it in the in the podcast we certainly feel it it's kind of how it started and it led to us also making our own short film which uh, is titled guardian so that was kind of exciting more yeah. on that later <laughs> oh boy we've now been doing the podcast for a little over a year um we've got a handful of episodes i think we're up to like 13 or 14 we record it not as frequently as we want to that's for sure we certainly wish that we could 
uh, I guess, record on a more routine basis. And we're trying to figure out a way to do that now, but it's obviously a little bit more difficult with uh, the current climate of the world. But uh, we're, we're, we're sorting it out. So hopefully uh, pretty soon we'll be back up and running and recording more frequently. So you know I got segments that I do on here, little activities, as I like to refer to them. Oh boy. So many activities. Well, see as how I'm a big fan of Silver Screen Anomalies and uh, Remake Rumble, I won't get too much into that because those are the kind of things that you do on yours. So we're going to do a little ripoff segment of Remake Rumble called Rip Off Rumble. Oh, I love it. I'm going to throw two movies at you and okay. you pick one. You can give a short little blurb on why you picked it if you want. If not, then no worries about it. This is just for fun. We're going to start with Ants or A Bug's Life. Oh, shit. Oh, this is a great one. Okay. Um, there's two answers for this one. Child Me would have picked a bug's life uh because it's pixar it's more entertaining the storytelling's a little better uh and less creepy but i think as an adult now and my with my weird jaded sensibilities if i had to pick one now i'd probably like ants more just because of the boldness and the storytelling it's super dark and weird and the big horrifying war scene with the maggots and all of, <laughs> all of, I also appreciate that they made the ants anatomically correct for how creepy and weird they are. And also Sylvester Stallone just mumbling over uh, a voice acting role was kind of fun. Uh, it's it's a weird, creepy, strange anomaly of a movie, but I think it maybe stands up a little more than A Bug's Life. We're going to go with adult you and ants for that one. I sure. Think. Sounds good. Number two, Armageddon in Deep Impact. Oh my God. Yep. Here we go. I'm just going to say it. I think Armageddon is better. It's just so goddamn corny and over the top. And it doesn't stop from the first second. Bruce Willis is just going for it. He's hamming it up. He knows what movie he's in. And it just leans so heavily into that shitty, like early 2000s, late 90s. The Aerosmith song is like the perfect personification of how over the top and ridiculous that movie is. And I, I remember really, really enjoying it. I haven't seen either of these movies in a long time, but the fact that I can remember all the plot beats to Armageddon speaks a lot of volumes to uh, how much of an effect that had over Deep Impact. That's a solid answer. Which brings us to our next one, Wyatt Earp and Tombstone. Oh, I'm going to go less descriptive on this one. Tombstone? Tombstone. I think that's, yeah, I think that's what I'm going to pick, and I'm not going to elaborate on that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. Tombstone's actually one of my favorites, too, now that, uh, now that I'm thinking of it. It's so good. My only explanation is, is that I've actually rewatched Tombstone while I, I've only seen the other one once, maybe, mm. like in passing. Supposedly, Kurt Russell directed Tombstone and made an agreement with the credited director to not tell anyone until that guy died. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I think that's accurate. It might just be an urban legend. Once again, I don't have a research assistant and I'm lazy, so. Look at you spouting facts I didn't know. That's sweet. Mm. Yeah. Learning, learn, some, learning something new about movies every day. That's yeah, I feel smart. <laughs> Next one, Dante's Peak or Volcano? <laughs> uh, I got to say Volcano. That's the one with Tommy Lee Jones in it, right? It's the one with Tommy Lee Jones. Oh, that movie's shit, but I love it. It's so it, it's kind of bad, but I remember everything about it. Me and my, I think it's just more of the sentimentality behind it. Again, like I'm, I have a soft spot for uh, movies that I watched with my mom. Uh, she got me into a lot of like horror cinema and stuff. So like we, uh, she got me. I, I always credit her as uh, the reason why I started watching a lot of horror movies. And uh, Volcano is not a horror movie, but she also loves her big dumb. I guess earth shattering uh, disaster movies disaster movies yeah so uh, that one has a fond place in my heart i love tommy lee jones because no matter what kind of movie is or the quality i feel like his acting conveys one of two things either he's perfectly portraying a grumpy old fuck or he's playing someone in a shitty movie and he's grumpy that he agreed to be in this movie and you can tell that is the best description of tommy lee jones i've ever heard yeah he's consistently grumpy he plays grumpy old fuck better than anybody uh, he, his face is like you can chisel that in the Mount R Rushmore. It's just chiseled stone of old. And I think he's always looked old. Like even at award shows and someone cracks a joke <laughs> and everyone's <laughs> laughing and they always pan to Tommy Lee Jones just with his grumpy old fuck face. <laughs> he looks like he hasn't moved in like three hours. Um, <laughs> yeah, he's just sitting there. I, I, I want them to check his pulse every time they cut to him because he's just scowling, not blinking and staring just vacantly. <laughs> at the stage yeah it's good shit the prestige or the illusionist oh okay this one's a little easier i i love the prestige 
Mm. I think it's terrific. Um, and it's an early no, earlier Nolan film that uh, a lot of people don't talk about anymore. And I think it's actually one of his best. It's really great. Um, everyone's really good in it. And I mean, it, yeah, of course it gets a little silly, but uh, it's, uh, it's grounded in a logic and uh, a believability that I can really grasp onto. Uh, Christian Bale is just, I mean, this was kind of like when I first started to notice him as a, for the chameleon that he is as an actor and he's terrific in it. It's really, really good stuff. And I mean, I, I like Hugh Jackman as well, but uh, I think Bale just kind of like completely uh, steals every scene he's in. Repo, the genetic opera or Repo Men? Uh, I got to go with the genetic opera. Yes. It's so much goddamn fun. Yeah, no, I watch that uh, every October. I have like a set tier of movies that I always queue up for October. Uh, the fall is my favorite time of the year. So I uh, have a certain set of movies that get me in a good mood. And uh, that is definitely one of them. It's just a lot of fun. That is, is ridiculous and it's excessive in every way. And the tunes are catchy. Yeah, exactly. It's a, if anyone hasn't seen that, it's worth checking out. It's a little over the top and ridiculous, but if you're in the right mindset for that, you're, you'll, you're in for a good time. You will love it. That's right. I'm a musical guy. Fuck you guys. There goes my tough guy. <laughs> <laughs> Final one. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. The Parrot Trap, or It Takes Two. Oh, Jesus. Um, just so for clarification, The Parent Trap is the one with Lindsay Lohan, right? And Lindsay Lohan. Yeah, that one. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I know that, I mean, to be fair, I don't think I like either of these movies. Um, <laughs> but if you're making me pick. You've just I mean, broken least, so many hearts. I know, I'm so sorry. And it's only for the, the vain excuse that I remember The Parent Trap specifically and maybe when Lindsay lohan was a little less coke addled and and innocent i think you're just picking that one because uh she's just harmless and whatnot but you're scared if you talk too much about it takes two the olsen twins will somehow find this on the internet with their mystical powers and they'll just stare at you with their death stares you know one of them knows when you die and the other one knows how you die i heard that. oh that's yeah <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I'm not going to lie. I've been dodging around this. The Olsen twins just creep me out. I'm not going to oh. lie. <laughs> That's pretty much it. Like, I, I never found them cute. All right, the, the truth is out. Sorry, I was reaching for an excuse. They just freak me the fuck out. Even when they were kids. They were uh, just too much when they were kids. They were just too goddamn much. They seemed like they were grown in the lab. Um, and it just freaked me out. There was something off about them. Sometimes when I watch movies... I'll like see a role and just in my head, I'll randomly think, Oh, like this guy could have also played this role. Like just some other actor who's not in the movie. Anytime there's like these two witches in like a castle or out in the woods or something that are like over a cauldron. I'm like, that could be the Olsen twins every goddamn time. 100%. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm, I respect that they've moved on to other things other than acting because uh, I appreciate it. Cause I don't have to see them. Yeah, exactly. Because as they've gotten older, uh, their the seams started to pull apart, and uh, the cuteness wore off. Because that's all they had going for them. Really, it wasn't acting chops, that's for sure. Elizabeth's a solid Olsen, though. Oh, love her. She's great. Yeah, uh, she's the Olsen twin that is genuinely talented and and successful, as far as I'm concerned. And I I noticed her before her Scarlet Witch. She was in a couple of great movies prior to that that should have gotten her more notice and attention, but never did. And I'm glad that people know who she is now. And she didn't have someone who looked exactly like her up to a point doing half the fucking workload. So that's just it. Yeah. She, you, you can actually kind of get by and totally disregard the fact that she is also one of the Olsen sisters because she doesn't really look like them. There's like su- subtle sim- similarities, but for the most part, very different looking. Yeah. You wouldn't have to put so much CG on her to make her look not creepy. I mean, we can certainly do that now. The fact that we can de-age Samuel L. Jackson and make him look convincing. Uh, <laughs> it's creepy what we can do with visual effects now. They almost could have made her look like Michelle Tanner again and put her in the Fuller House for the final season. Oh my God, you're right. Yeah, it's more of a question of should we do that more than can we do that now with visual effects, I'm noticing. You, you know, like the recreations of dead actors and stuff is starting to get a little out of hand. That's a hard one. That is a really hard subject. Yep. I personally have of, of the mind that uh, I think we should leave them alone. Also, it's incredibly difficult to uh, create a human being digitally just because there's so many subtle little things in a performance that you just don't that's why we have the uncanny valley effect where they just look like rubber plastic monsters 
talking at your face. But sometimes it's just, I'm like with the de-aging thing, as long as that person's still performing the role themselves, I don't have very much of a problem with that. No, like you said, fine. the dead actor bringing them back, it's just, it's creepy. And I don't know like where that falls as far as like being respectful to them is. But at the same time, if the role was theirs, like uh, Peter Cushing in the, in the Star Wars uh, Rogue One, like that was his role. So you're kind of letting him keep that. But yeah, I have no idea how I feel about some of those. Yeah, it's it's true. The uh, Grand Moff Tarkin in the room. Yeah, he's a. Yeah. Uh, it was a little distracting. Carrie Fisher is actually the most glaring thing in that movie. That yeah, like, uh, it, it hurts to see that because it's like oh, love Carrie. You know, um, I'm playing. A, I'm playing a PlayStation Three game now. Apparently. Yeah, that's what it looks like. It reminds me of, and it's not, it's so hard to use video games as a, a very common criticism with visual effects is like, it's just like a video game. And it's like, well, video games look kind of fucking great right now. Um, it's more of just, it's at a place. Yeah, exactly. Like video games look that, good for video games, but you take a video game character and put them in a movie, that'd be like putting a football player in a hockey rink. Exactly. That's probably a better way to describe it because it's not to discredit video games at all because, uh, there's some pretty amazing shit in video games, obviously. I would have liked de-aging, I think. Um, a movie that you reviewed on a silver screen you liked was uh, Dr. Sleep. And mm-hmm. I found that uh, Henry Thomas was very distracting as Jack Torrance because he wasn't Jack Nicholson. Yeah, it would have been a lot better. And I understand what he, the role that he's stepping into because I felt I had the exact same opinion. But I also am willing to accept the fact that stepping into the shoes of Jack Nicholson, especially from that time, is just an overwhelming task. Like, you just, Mm. you can't channel him. And he chose to channel him. And I get that because it would have actually been, no matter what way he would have handled it, it probably would have been a complaint across the board because you had the actress who played Shelley Duvall in that movie. And she was awesome. Like, she did such a good job. If you had her performing Shelley Duvall's manic energy, if she was channeling that successfully and he didn't even try to do Nicholson, I think a lot of people probably would have been upset. I don't envy his position, but yeah, it was distracting. And a lot of it was just because he was trying to tap into that sort of like long, sort of overdrawn, dramatic Nicholson snarky thing. And I don't know, it didn't work for me either, but it's a, it's a drop in the bucket of complaints of, for that movie because that movie is excellent. And oh, it was fantastic. I couldn't wait to see it in the theaters. I watched The Shining bef- like beforehand just to get back into that mood. And I was kind of like, uh, is this going to live up? Totally lived up. Yeah, absolutely. I, I adored it. And I am a, I'm a sucker for The Shining. I love it. I've loved it a long time. Uh, I even visited the uh, exterior location in the States uh, and get to hold the axe and everything, which is pretty fun. Ooh. Yeah, it was, <laughs> I have photo evidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a it's a big ski lodge kind of in the oregon washington ish area there it's, it's great definitely worth a visit because uh, obviously like the interiors of that were all like built on a sound stage um just because the the sets obviously don't make sense a big part of what makes the shining so cool is like a lot of those rooms don't line up at all if you're watching and you're paying attention to where windows are and stuff you're like mm. why the fuck is there a window there so it must have been really fun in dr sleep to recreate those but oh. add like a little bit of an age to them. Yeah, definitely. That would, you could see, I think like Ewan McGregor, when he was in that, I could almost tell like he was enjoying like those scenes, I think a bit more like, I don't know. There's just a little bit more of a spark to him. I found maybe I'm just, I was yeah. looking for it, but completely agree. Uh, he like walks in and he like where the, the hears Johnny hole in the door and he just kind of puts his face in there. And I was like, yeah, there's just this, a little bit of an extra enthusiasm, I thought. Oh, yeah. That scene where he is walking around and air quotes, waking up the hotel and the lights are all turning on and flickering and shit. And he's basically just kind of doing the, you could argue it's the fan service sequence where he's walking down the hallways and sort of reacting to all of the history of the hotel that they experienced when he was mm-hmm. a kid. But uh, I loved it. I don't care. Like, it worked for me. I'm a fan and it worked. We'll it's, call it, it like a culmination of all the events rather than a fan service. That's Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a bit more of a better way to describe it. So you uh, you mentioned earlier you did a movie called Guardian. Uh, that's available on YouTube now, if I'm not mistaken. It is. How was that? Uh, it, that was mostly a learning experience, but one of the more invigorating things I think I've ever done in my life. As an artist, it's really difficult to stay inspired. And, and uh, I guess I'm sure a lot of other artists or people who are creative types 
can attest to this, that it's difficult to stay motivated on one particular project and like keep the love and passion that you had in like the beginning stages of that, the sparks of that going all the way through and finishing it and with the same level of inspiration you had going in. With Guardian, it was basically just kind of a brainchild of, it's Hallie's writing, first of all, it's her script, it was her story from the get-go. But as soon as I read it, like the second I read it, it was kind of like instant sparks. Um, We were sitting, uh, having coffee, doing our usual thing where we were just shooting the shit, chit-chatting about movies. And then it just dropped into my my lap, essentially, where I just brought up out of nowhere. I was just like, why the fuck don't we make a movie? Why don't we make a short? I was just, at that time, I was starting to kind of get inspired by people online who were shooting movies on cell phones. Even big directors were doing it. Like Steven Soderbergh made his movie Unsane completely on the iPhone 7. Yeah, I saw that. And, the theaters. and I was just like, I have a cell phone. Why the fuck don't I, don't I do this, right? Like, what's, what's stopping me? And the answer was nothing. So I brought this up to Hallie and I was just like, if only we had like a script that was self-contained and had one character in one location and it was cheap and easy to shoot. And then she just immediately pulls it out of her bag. And (laughs) And I was just like, are you fucking kidding me? And she described it to me and it was just everything that I wanted for like a first short. And then of course the two of us went on to uh, band together a small little merry group of enthusiastic people that were willing to work with us to, to make this thing who were, who had also never made a movie before either. So everyone was equally inspired. We got like a little makeup crew. We got the actress in the movie, Anastasia Cook. Uh, she's one of my former students uh, at the uh, animation college. So she was obviously completely enamored with the idea. She's also a lover of horror and stuff. It was really easy actually to kind of get all the moving pieces together and get this thing off the ground. But it was a lot of work. It was more work than I think even I was prepared for. Sorry, Even I was prepared for. Uh, We can get that in the edits for you. I'm not going to, but we could (laughs) have. Leave that in. (laughs) Um, It was something that even though I had fully immersed myself in the process of how you go about making a short film, I was not prepared for how much work it was. It was six months straight of pre-production. I did all the storyboards which you can actually, I think, find on our Eldritch Facebook page, where we planned everything out. We found a location, which was in a mutual friend of Hallie and another uh, person working on the set, their house. They were gracious to let us go in and literally rip apart a room. Uh, we had to dismantle like a king-size bed and put that in the, like the kids' room and everything and just move every, like we completely tore apart their room. They were, of course, grateful in the end because uh, even though they let us invade their space for a couple of days, we, we took pictures of the room and completely rebuilt it as it was, and it was just cleaner. <laughs> so they were, they, were, they were mostly pretty grateful about it. Maybe you could come film in the kitchen and then the bathroom as well. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So it was, a, it was a lengthy process. We had a producer, uh, Marie David, who's worked on some other short films. She was with us as well and got, guiding us every step of the way. and. Uh, giving us a bit of a worldly knowledge on how these things work, um, which was a learning process for both of us, I think, because we just kind of went in with like, we just want to make a movie. (laughs) Um, But there's a lot more moving pieces. You have, there's paperwork. There's a paperwork side to making movies that people don't talk about and they probably should. So we had to deal with some of that, of course. That That sounds awful. It was. Uh, It sucked. I hated it. (laughs) Thankfully, I'm so grateful for Marie on that short because she handled a lot of it for us. So going forward, if we were to self-produce, we would obviously uh, go ahead and do all of that ourselves. But God, it's a pain in the ass. Just throwing a warning out there to uh, your partner, Hallie, if she's listening, there's going to be paperwork for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see. Well, I'm sure all we'll split it evenly. We seem to do a pretty good job of that. Um, but That sounded uh, sincere, by the way, just pointing that out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure she won't do 120% of it. Busy drawing a storyboard, can't talk, bye. Bye, drawing. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll see. But we go back and we look at it now, it's funny because one of the things that we did at the end of last year was we actually watched Guardian again and tore it apart. There's things in it, obviously, it is a very cheap, you can tell it's made for no money, short film, just kind of a 12 minute passion project that is just a culmination of everyone's skill sets on display. And I think even though like there's definitely some uh, wearing and tearing at the seams, the short film is something that we're really proud of. Something that like for a first short, it, it taught us a lot. I know I picked up an awful lot just from like a cinematography and shooting standpoint and blocking and framing, and then also lighting uh, and post work. 
it was a it was an undertaking to edit um, and get it good and ready to go for uh, showing it off on YouTube to people and things like that. So it was uh, it was it was a learning process. And there was also a monster in the movie. Spoilers. Um, <gasps> oh my god. Um, there's a monster in the movie, and it was uh, something that I uh, hold near and dear to my heart. That I uh, I'm super grateful for the project alone for working with Hallie to come up with a design for that creature and uh, putting my own monster in a short. It was a super pride-filled experience. I've seen it. Spoiler alert, the monster is uh, his ex-girlfriend's face on a lawn gnome's body. Oh, darn. You gave it away. (laughs) (laughs) So we got some segments uh, that are kind of staples in this. And by staples, I mean I've done it once, so this is going to be the second time around. Do you remember Celeb Smack Talk? Uh, Yes, I do. I'm dreading it a little bit. Well, let's see. Let's let's do it. I mean, I already mentioned him earlier. Let's Let's go to Ryan Gosling. Oh, Gosser, get ready and go. What am I supposed to do again? Talk shit about him for like 10, 15 seconds. Where the fuck do you get all those jackets from? Like, come on. Like, you have the biggest repository of jackets ever. Why can't I have them? Can I steal them? Where do you live? Also, that cereal meme is like one of the coolest things you've done. But uh, holy shit, what's with your face? Do you move your face? How frequently do you move your face? It's not a whole lot in movies. Also, La La Land sucks. Sucks my balls. <laughs> that's what I was waiting for. And that's the kind of reviews that you can find with uh, Skylar Greenhorn. No, he doesn't. Go to IMHO and you can see my full synopsis of La La Land. And it's just one sentence. La La Land. It sucks my balls. The end. That sounds more like uh, if I'd watch a movie and I'd make a post and you like these every now and then, which I thought was hilarious because you have like very well thought out reviews. There's a movie I said like my re- spoiler free review of this movie. It sucks. My spoiler review of this movie. It fucking sucks. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would, I would see those and it would make me chuckle just because when you water down a review, that's really what someone who doesn't like a movie is trying to say. Is there a movie that everyone else likes that you hate? So I can think of a few. Oh, fuck. That's a good question. I hate Boyhood. I've never watched Boyhood. Don't. It's three and a half hours of watching an annoying kid turn into a twerp of a teenager and then the most pretentious garbage person I've ever seen in my life. Oh, dang it. The Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movies. I didn't mind Andrew Garfield as Spider-Man. I thought he looked like a 35-year-old man invading a high school, and I got immediately creeped out. I thought that about Tobey Maguire as Spider-Man, actually. That's true, but his crying face, though. its It was a good meme, and that's it. I don't care for Tobey Maguire's acting. No, me neither. Uh, his dancing scene is uh, is it legendary in the meme world. But His shit acting was actually perfect for that movie because those scenes were shit. So I was like, oh, this is, this is well made for you. Like, this is a match made in heaven. A shitty scene with a shitty actor. Oh, my God, Willem Dafoe, though. Yeah, is amazing. Uh, J.K. Simmons. Yeah, he's he is J. Jonah Jameson. There's a reason why. In is this spoilers? I don't give a shit. Whatever. Just fucking do it. I'm just gonna do it. Um, in the most recent Spider-Man movie, the post credit scene brings him back as J.K. Simmons, or, or sorry, as a uh, J. Jonah Jameson. Wonderful. Like that's the only thing they could do. Who else are you gonna get? Idea for remake Rumble. You ready for this? I'm ready. 1995's Judge Dredd versus 2012's Dredd. I mean. I could easily tell you what the answer is going to be. Oh, yeah. But I would love to do that episode. Spoilers. <clears throat> it's dread. Uh, yeah. Holy shit. That movie's awesome. I guess that was a, I guess that was a stupid question for me to ask which one would, would win. But the fun part of that would be exploring why it's better. And also, it was a great segue into five stupid questions. Are you familiar oh, with this? I am. Yes. Uh, I remember the segment. Uh, yeah, you just ask me five stupid questions and I have to answer. Just let me do the fucking lead in, man. Okay, you do it. In life, we are told there are no stupid questions. You will be posed with five of them. Are you ready? Yes, go for it. What movie star would you want playing goalie on your hockey team? Oh, fuck. Um, okay, who played the kingpin in Daredevil again? Michael Clark Duncan. Oh, did, oh, the show. Yeah, uh, Vincent D'Onofrio just because he would literally take up the entirety of the goalie net. Very well thought out. Question the second. What kind of tape do you enjoy the smell of the most? Oh, God. I mean, does tape have a smell? Some of it does. In true red-green fashion, I guess I'll just go with duct tape. I will point out that we are all in quarantine, so if you can get your hand on some rolls of tape, I expect a better research answer at some point. No problem. I'll sniff as many tape rolls as I have in my apartment. 
and then I'll get back to you on that one. What cartoon character did you have the biggest crush on? Oh shit. That's a hard one. Cause so many, <laughs> so many cartoon character, huh? I mean, it's hard to deny Kim possible a little bit. Uh, there's a, there's a little bit of something there with Kim possible. It's, it's that independent, strong female character or something that kind of struck a chord. I don't know. Catwoman. I'm a sucker for Catwoman. Green corn, you fucking minx. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there's a list. I'm sure I can make a list. Favorite Disney princess is Belle from Beauty and the Beast. Oh, Stockholm Syndrome and all. Oh, this could get pretty R-rated, so we're going to go on to question the fourth. Great. What's your Spice Girl name? Oh, my God. So it's got to be like a spice, right? So it's always a baby spice, scary spice, sporty spice. Fuck. Let's go with creamy spice. Creamy <laughs> spice. It sounds disgusting. And it comes just after you were thinking about Kim Possible, so we're not gonna a, we're not gonna try to connect those two right there. It's a play on my last name too, uh, Greencorn. And, and oh, I, some people would uh, jokingly call me Creamed Corn. That's good. Yeah. God damn, I'm upset with myself for not thinking of that ever. Yeah, I hate it. Thanks, I hate it. And the final question: What type of sorrow goes best with your coffee? Oh, existential dread for sure. I went from being a stupid question to like a revealing insight of your psyche. Oh God. It's, it's just, it's every day for me. <laughs> world we live in now. Oh, ain't it the truth? Ain't it the truth? That's why I mix whiskey and mine. Oh, that's, that's a great idea. <laughs> got to do it the Irish way. All right. So do you got anything you want to plug? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I've been talking about them and rambling is probably the more appropriate term uh, about uh, Eldritch Creative, which is mine and Hallie's small little up and start entertainment company that we're trying to build. Uh, right now, it's very, very small and we're trying to build up some numbers and get some people, I guess, noticing us and uh, listening to our content and checking us out. So I do, we do have a Facebook page. You can find us at Facebook at Eldritch Creative. Uh, on Instagram, it's eldritch.creative, and Twitter is eldritchcreate. And uh, you can also look me up individually. I do a lot of artwork. I'm a digital artist, so and I post a lot of that stuff. So you can find me on Facebook under Emerald Sky. I have an art station account that you can actually look up as well, uh, just under my name, Skylar Greencorn. That's pretty much it. All the shame, shameless plugs. Will you draw me? I could do that. Yes. I'm doing a ton of fan art. Why not? Uh, I'm bored in this uh, isolation that we have now. So I'm doing all kinds of fan art requests right now. I actually finished some this morning before I uh, did this call. All right. Will you get my good side? Send me a, a picture and I'll just replicate it. So you No, no, no. It. I want you to imagine this. Oh, or, fuck. I want to know that you're thinking of me, that I'm embedded in your brain during this. Okay. All right. This <laughs> is a challenge that I'm willing to do. All right. And you're going on to record later on today for a new episode of Silver Screen Anomalies, which you can also find on what, just about any podcasting. I think so. Yeah. I mean, the main one that seems to be uh, marketed is Spotify, of course. Um, you can find us on there. I, I do believe we're on like Apple Podcasts as well, if that's your thing. Buzzsprout. Yeah. You can just look up Silver Screen Anomalies and you'll find us. We have about 13 or 14 episodes right now. So yeah, we're working on the new one now. Awesome. Well, I won't keep you from it. Uh, I want to thank you for jumping on here. You've actually been a big help in me getting this together with insights and uh, pointers and little bits of wisdom that you've encountered across your 13 episodes. It is 13. Get your shit together, bud. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm such a hack fraud. <laughs> Don't listen to anything I say. All right. So we're going to let Skylar off to record his uh, Silver Screen Anomalies episode. I encourage you all, if you're a movie fan, to catch that. Do you want to cue the exit music? You can cue the exit music. It's your show. You sure? All you got to do is say hit it. Okay, fine. I'll do it. <clears throat> hit it. Hit it.